Another American psychologist who contributed to our understanding of learning and behavior was John B. Watson. Born in South Carolina in 1878, Watson traveled to Chicago in 1900 to attend the university. There in Chicago, he encountered and studied under a number of really eminent figures in philosophy and psychology, learned a lot of important stuff, right? But like Pavlov, there was certainly one figure who affected him more than any other. And that man was Jack Loeb, a German-American biologist and physiologist who had been nominated many times for the Nobel Prize in science itself. Loeb was different. He departed from traditional views that explained animal behavior by reference to internal mechanisms. Why does it all have to be about what's inside? What about the impact of the outside world, the environment around us? So, he argued that external factors contributed to the responses of organisms. Sounds very much like behavioral psychology, doesn't it? In perhaps his most famous experiments, Loeb managed to artificially induce parthogenesis in the eggs of sea urchins, a fancy word that basically refers to how an organism might reproduce you know, have babies without the eggs being fertilized. By slightly modifying the chemical composition of the water in which the sea urchin's eggs rested, Loeb caused the eggs to begin embryonic development even though the eggs hadn't been fertilized. In other words, what was making the sea urchin embryos grow was not an internal variable like sperm, but an external variable like the chemicals in the water. Inspired by Loeb and others, Watson became adamant in turning our attention to behavior, as even the title of his now famous text, Behaviorism, can attest. And to Watson, the only type of behavior that scientists should study is learned behavior. Reflexes, like salivation, cannot be seriously considered as a source of our behavior. What matters is the behavior we learn, which is the result of conditioning, our interaction with the environment. Watson's rejection of unobservable behavior was so stern, in fact, that his form of psycho psych psychological research has come to be known as radical behaviorism. Watson wrote, the time seems to have come when psychology must discard all references to consciousness, when it no longer needs to delude itself into thinking that it is making mental states the object of observation. In other words, forget all this nonsense about the mind. Theories about mental states, mental variables, mental conflicts can never be proven. A true scientist, if that's what a psychologist claims to be, must be guided by discipline in his research, loyal to the goals of objective scientific research. And, scientific psych and a scientific psychologist should only study learned, observable behavior. Like Pavlov and Thorndike, Watson proposed to study the effects of conditioning on subjects. Only he chose human subjects, a very controversial choice to say the least. In his experiments, he actually attempted to condition children and infants, something which today would be unthinkable as in, and is, is in fact illegal. But in the 1920s, Watson could still do it. But what he, did, what he did was to begin with simple classical conditioning. He would expose a nine-month-old baby, whom he called Albert B., to a variety of stimuli. For example, a mouse. Now imagine, if you put a mouse in front of a baby, what would be the baby's response? Usually not one of fear. Actually, a baby has no reason to fear a tiny white mouse. He has no experience with such animals and no reason to fear them. 
So Albert is curious about the mouse, but not afraid. He might reach out and touch the mouse. What is this funny little creature? But then, when Albert was 11 months old, Watson paired the mouse with a loud, fr frightening clang, a hammer striking a mental bar, the kind of noise which would naturally frighten a baby. So now you have little Albert sitting there, and first he sees the mouse, and then immediately after that he hears the clang. Mouse clang, mouse clang. That's pairing, right? Just like Pavlov did. What's the result? After a month or so of this classical conditioning, when Albert is presented the mouse alone with no loud noise, he exhibits a fearful response. He's been conditioned to fear a harmless little white mouse. And not just a white mouse, but anything that resembles it, like a white cat, a dog, or even a fur coat, thanks to the process of generalization, which means we respond to similar sim stimuli with the same behavior. But it doesn't end there. During these experiments, Watson's wife, Rosalie Rayner Watson, was standing by to help them. And it turns out, when Albert became frightened by the mouse, he would crawl to Mrs. Watson for comfort. And consequently, his fear would be reduced. Albert sees the mouse, he's afraid, he moves to Mrs. Watson, she touches him or picks him up, the mouse is left behind, and because the mouse is no longer an immediate threat, Albert feels better. What we have now, then, is instrumental conditioning. Albert's behavior, moving away from the frightening object, is rewarded by a reduction in his fear. And because his behavior is rewarded, he is much more likely to repeat that behavior the behavior of moving away from objects that frighten him. When Watson presented his conclusions to the scientific community, he made a point of ridiculing the Freudians on Albert's behavior, suggesting that should Albert grow up and become a neurotic adult, he might go to a Freudian psychoanalysis for help. Unfortunately, Watson said the psychoanalyst would waste time looking at dreams for answers, looking for mental problems that simply do not exist. Rather, Watson made two conclusions from his research with children. First, Freud was wrong about the importance of sexual impulses in motivating child's personality development. The personality of a child, Watson argued, could just as easily be shaped by, fearful, by learned fears. Second, irrational fears or phobias can be the result of experiences in the environment. In other words, such fears are not caused by mental phenomena that we can't see, but by conditioning. And if behavior is determined by external variables, then certainly behavior, all the relevant behavior of, the, of an, an individual, can be controlled by manipulating those external variables. In a now quite famous, even infamous quote, Watson argued in 1930, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take anyone at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select, doctor, lawyer, artist, artist, regardless of his talents, perchance, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. 